Hey everyone, it's Tyranny Time! So, new Obsidian game came out uh, from the makers of Pillars of Eternity and Alpha Protocol and the first South Park game and so on. By the way, side note, because uh, Obsidian games keep showing up on this channel, I'm actually, I just found out just now that the second South Park game is not by Obsidian. That's actually kind of a bummer. It's an in-house Ubisoft studio, which is usually how things lose all of their fun and creativity, but we'll see. Maybe it won't be terrible. I don't know. I hope. I hope it's good, because I'm playing it when it comes out. But anyway, Tyranny, new CRPG from uh, Obsidian. I'm always surprised how fast some of these can come out, just because, uh, like, Pillars of Eternity wasn't that long ago, it feels like, necessarily. But it, I guess that's the one of the nice things about making this style of game, is that even though it's a uh, big, expansive campaign, they take surprisingly less time to make because of the fidelity of the assets used and everything. Gone through the options a little bit here. Turn down voice frequency, which is a, I'm happy to see that option there. It, it starts at 50%, but you can do 100%, I guess. I might even turn it down even more. It's just how much your characters shout out their little one-liners all the time. There's a lot of nice options here and uh, all over the place. Like, you can turn on and off, like, how I, whether or not you will see how dialogue options affect reputation. I turn that off. I don't want, I don't like things motive, I don't like things affecting my decisions in video games that are outside of the decision very much, so I don't want to have it being like, this will increase your reputation if you say this, even though you don't want to say it. Like, if, I'll, if I, I, I might make, I might make a decision to make someone happy, but it'll be because I make the call, the call on my own and not because the, the pop-up tells me about that. So, going through difficulty stuff. I didn't do anything here. Uh, turn on some auto-pause stuff, mostly, uh, when something really horrible happens, like a character death or finding out your weapon, you literally can't hurt something. Or just the basic stuff of like when combat starts, so I don't get completely off cut off guard. And there's a few other things throughout here that are nice to see. I'm amused by Gibbs. I might turn that on just to see what it looks like. But yeah, you can turn on Gibbs, which is a uh, core effects basically. You can also turn on big head mode, which I find amusing. We might toggle that on briefly for a bit. I don't know. Maybe it'll turn out to be helpful for the visuals or something. But I don't necessarily think that'll help the atmosphere necessarily. <laughs> Let's get started. Hello. So they have a bit of a stylized visual thing going on here compared to the previous ones, which allows it to look a little better when looked up at it up close, where previously games like Wasteland 2 and Pillars were definitely more of a, hey, look from look at this from really far away type of thing. Kind of a necessity when you're making games like this with a studio like this. So, despite the fact that this is basically like, the premise more or less here is that the bad guys won and have taken over the world and everything. Even now, there's still kind of a dichotomy between two different groups that are kind of, sort of, two different... Like, one's one's more chaotic and one's more lawful, it would seem. At least on the first surface level. One of them looks like an organized military and the other one looks like just barbarians, basically. We'll see. We'll see which one's more fun, too. <laughs> uh, so, in the Northern Empire... Where you were born, men enjoy equal protections under the laws of the overlord Kairos. In the southern lands of the Tears, only men may own or captain ships, but real estate is restricted to women. Men may lease, but durable uh, ownership of the land in the Tears always passes to the eldest daughters or sister. Interesting. Got a gender dichotomy here. Most sons enter their father's profession. Uh, by their mid-teens, without a profession or a family lands to work, can find purpose by pledging service to one of the Overlord's mighty Archons. Criminals, derelicts, and others are often conscripted into the armies of the Archons. If a child cannot forge his own skin, I think, I, that might be skin or skine, uh, he will certainly find one in battle. I do wonder if it's some sort of armory, some sort of, uh, like an actual pelt or or armor armor of some kind. Oh, I see what's going on here. So women have control over land and men have control over sea in in the tears. That's a split I've never seen before. Okay. You have a few body types as you wait them to, wait for them to slowly load in. And they're all basically variations of just being in decent shape, basically. They're, it's not explicitly a, a fat body type. Which isn't much of a surprise, because you're some sort of warrior group. So you can be super tall, stocky, 
or the usual hero build, basically. This usually makes you look pretty good in armor. And I think I'm going to build an armored character this time around, so this kind of build actually usually fits that kind of setup, where this looks a little strange sometimes. There's skin options. I imagine the hair will make more sense for some of the skin options when we actually get the chance to pick one. Hello. That's a nice selection of portraits, just like before. All these really detailed paintings, and as per usual, you can pick absolutely any of them without any of them being restricted to what your other decisions are. I'll definitely take some time to look through all these one by one. So we can change our phys physical appearance between a few different faces. Can I zoom in better? I don't think I can zoom in better, actually. Alright, we'll just have to look from here. So, only five faces total of various levels of concerned looking and maybe a bit annoyed <laughs> as you go from one to the other. Let's try the hair options. Wait, was there a scroll bar on that one? There was not. Alright, I'm not crazy. You can be bald. By the way, I know that this always takes up a chunk of the first episode because it's character creation, but skipping it doesn't make sense either because it's important to this to this kind of game. But I'll be sure to play a good half an hour or so in the first episode at least of actual game after we get past this. So we got long hair, mohawks, mess hair, split hair. Ha! Slicked back. Even more slicked back. Slicked backiest of... No, that's actually ponytail. <laughs> Sure. And facial hair options. That's a very World of Warcraft beard right there, isn't it? <laughs> I think I had a character that looked like that at some point. I could probably create my World of Warcraft character. I had an old rogue that I played as for like... 300 days back in the day, because I used to be into raiding, and that was a problem. <laughs> I could probably create more or less the same character here. There we go. I ended up doing what I do sometimes, which is I, I picked a character portrait I liked and made a character that looked like the portrait instead. <laughs> uh, some people get mad when I do that, but I like it when the two would look similar, and sometimes you have to reverse engineer it a bit. So we've got a bunch of voice options here. Sneaky. Moving cautiously. You must rest. Soon. Right. Huh. Heads up, we have come. You learn something every day. The no that point. wasn't so hard. On the lookout. My wounds are slowing me down. See that? Heads up, we have company. You learn something every day. This will be fun. Quiet down! You must rest soon. And none. You just have no voice actor, which is totally valid. Found something. To battle! Flawless! You learn something every day. This'll be fun. There's definitely moments where it feels like a contradiction of the character that you envision in your head if you give them no voice of, of any kind. You know what? I'm looking at this bar up here. This will probably take a long time. I'll maybe I should call this part zero and call the real story part part one or something. Okay. We've got a bunch of tattoo options here. Oh, jeez. They go all over the place, don't they? Alright, so you can, go, you can do the full Wolverine, apparently. Be a little bit more like... More like that. Is your Wolverine? How much are we gonna see their body to know to see that in the first place? That's too. That's, this is too comically tribal in some of these cases. Oh, geez. That's just a superhero suit at that point. Hello, face tattoo. Interesting life choices there. Hey, they are the bad guys, potentially. Probably. Shoulder brand. Wait, where? Oh, hand tattoos. Okay. Back to the face again. Always with the face with these guys. Arm again. Oh, that's neat. Good druid... Uh, nature caster type thing for sure. For example. Oh, they're on his... Calves. Okay. Chin is not the worst type of tattoo. It's vaguely, at least it still falls in the territory of where you expect the beard to be. Too bad you can't customize these a little bit more and get rid of some of them. Unless... Nope. That's like individual parts of one tattoo changing color. So you can't... I was wondering if maybe you could like make the one part transparent and make the arm ones not transparent or something. But nope, that level of customization is not really here. 
snake legs. <laughs> and a little arm brand. Let's go for a quick arm tattoo. That's something. A little double color there, a uh, deeper red on the, red on the back of the hand. Just because it feels like I'd be skipping on an element of the game a little bit if I went with no tattoo completely. But some of these are a little too silly. The full body Wolverine stripes. Ha! <laughs> Alright, so we can choose a series of different histories here. We can be a pit fighter, a hunter, a guild apprentice, noble scion, soldier, lawbreaker, war mage, and diplomat. Okay, this one actually sounds like a fun premise. Lawbreaker. Accused of a crime you most certainly did commit, you stood before Tunan the Educator, Archon of Justice, and argued your case with eloquence and conviction. Impressed by your logic, reason, and confidence, he found you guilty anyway. It is rumored that Tunan selects many of his agents from his prisoners. Who better to catch the wicked than those versed in such ways? In his mercy, Tunan offered you the choice of two sentences. Decades languishing in prison, or a lifetime serving him in the court of Fatebringers. The choice was an easy one, and instead of seeing the inside of a cell, you were trained in letters and numbers, magic and war. The laws you once broke are now yours to interpret and enforce. Hello. Primary expertise. You were trained in the following combat style. Sword and shield. Great sword. Short bow. Shock spells. Vigor spells. What does that mean? Oh, bonuses to your, yourself and your allies. That might be a good one. Javelin. Dual wielding. Unarmed attacks. Frost spells and atrophy spells. Okay, so a whole bunch of basic weapons, both ranged and melee. You can be a you can be a puncher, you can be a dual wielder. You get, there's a few there's two versions of throwing weapons. There's two-handed weapon, sword and board as you give it, as you'd expect. Two attack elements, one uh, debuff element, and one buffing element. I'm thinking of doing a sort of if I can some variation of paladin or something because I've I've played a lot of RPGs now with parties and I often like the idea of my protagonist being a rogue type character or a bow user like a ranger and stuff like that especially rangers i've used that three times now i think but uh my party has always seemed to work best when my main character who is often a mandatory party member is one of those nice pillars of a party so it's like it's nice to have them be like a more of a tanky support or even support character so if i could be like a tank that can also buff the party to uh do well during combat like that may work well for me so Sword and Shield and Vigor could both be good. So I'm, it looks like I got two options here. Primary and secondary, I think. So let's see. So Sword and Shield, for example. Hello. Each one has their own visual appearance. Oh, I should have... Oh, never mind. Oh, no, they have their own visual appearances. I might as well cycle through these so you guys can see them. That's a cool looking one. Javelin. Oh, yeah. Thrown weapons. That's a cool idea, actually. Good compromise between melee and range. Thrown weapons deal more damage than bows, but cannot attack from far away. Or as far away. They also have a benefit of being able to switch to ranged and melee attacks between, uh, depending on the enemy's distance. Good for thrown, dodge, parry, and athletics. No, so not a, t not a terrible survival build and some versatility of range. And it is, the, it is the type of spec you don't see very often in games, so it actually might not be a terrible option too. Although Sword and Shield gives you... Oh, parry. They both give you parry. This one gives you parry and dodge, while this one just gives you parry. Being a thrown weapon character could be fun. That's something different. You choose an ability. Oh, you choose abilities for each one, too. There's dual wielding. Unarmed attacks. That's strange to me as a concept. It's always there. Frost. So, so all the spellcasters kind of look the same, but with a different particle effect coming off the end. I think I do like the idea of javelin. That sounds like a fun new thing. I might do Javelin Vigor if I can. So you need to pick one of these two skills, it looks like. You can pick from Heart Shot. 20 second cooldown. Does X amount of damage. To compare, it does... Uh, more damage than this one does over here, at least. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like, looks like 8 to 12 is your primary damage at, when you make your character. And this one gives you a bonus, and this is normal damage. It has a longer cooldown. 
All right, so uh, Heart Shot causes your enemy to bleed for 20 seconds. Has a bonus to accuracy, can be used with bows and thrown weapons. Delay your aim to focus on hitting the target's heart. Gain additional accuracy for this attack and leave the target bleeding. Hobble. Target becomes hobbled for 30 seconds. Target your enemy's feet with a ranged attack, hobbling them if successful. I do like the bleed idea, so I think I'm gonna go for that one. So now next. Secondary expertise, and as expected, it is the same ones again. If I pick Javelin again, oh, you can pick the other skill. Interesting. Quite interested in Vigor, though. Let's see. Why is Heart Shot showing up here? Oh, it's showing for my other class. The School of Vigor is a utility branch of magic that focuses on granting bonuses to yourself and your allies. The skill you get with it is Titan's Touch. 24 second cooldown. Allied target gets 2 vitality and 2 might for 45 seconds. Range of 2 meters. Fill the target with Surge of Greatness, granting them a bonus to might and vitality. This could be a, an interesting, versatile support character for my main character. Let's see here. This gives me 2 Control Vigor, 1 to Magic Staff, 5 to Lore, 6 to Throne Weapons. The concern here, of course, is do you need a staff to cast spells, or can you cast them without a weapon? It's the beginning of the game, so if I, it turns out to not work out, I could always come back and find out. But I do, I do like the idea of this character. Let's see how it pans out. Let's see, this, let's check this, the, uh... Right-click for details, by the way. Nope, I think it's just the same screen, honestly. Uh, it does not say it requires a staff. It uh, attacks based on uh, control, vigor, and lore, whereas javelin attacks based on that's just, that's a shield that that I get for my weapon. Uh, heart shot. Oh right, so these say valid weapons, bow and thrown weapons. So that means that vigor not saying valid weapons means that it could be used by anything. So that's good. So one concern, of course, is that the attack skills vary from one thing to the other. And so there's not much synergy as far as building your character goes between these two things. But we'll see how that goes exactly. I'm curious, let's try it out. I do realize that I'm kind of contradicting my original statement of, of not doing a weird character and just doing something nice and mandatory. Just trying to have fun. But also trying to make smart decisions. And often, those don't always match. <laughs> so we can make our own crest, so you can pick any of these coat of arms. Look at that. The hashes of murder. <laughs> I, I have expected the shield to change, but it's a it's a it's an it's the Archon symbol for the shield. So you can only change your banner. Decent number of pictures here too. So you pick one of these pictures, then you pick a background color, then you pick a symbol color. Oh, you can also change the colors of the character themselves too. So that affects the outside, this affects my pants. So some of it definitely doesn't change. I kind of like this one. It has implications of an eye, which I'm, I'm someone that's supposed to be bringing about some sort of justice, or at least some some ver someone's version of justice. And it's also got the implication of like a target symbol, for accuracy's sake. And it looks like a shield and a javelin at the same time. So it kind of fits for a number of reasons almost. I kind of like that idea. Alright, so I thought about this one a bit. I'm gonna name him Guy Love Bridge. Because I used that name in a uh, in Stranger of Sword City, and it kinda felt wasted in that game, because then the game was then like, hey, give yourself a uh, side give yourself a weird uh, nickname, and then the game calls you that nickname for the rest of the game. I'm like, no, but you had me come up with a name. So maybe it'll show up here this time around. And that'll be a little better. Also, I find the name kind of amusing, because I'm supposed to be like this. Justic, this Justicar of a dark empire, and so having a, a, a distinctly not evil name, act, not not like I'm not like I'm not fr I'm not freaking called Malfurion, Storm Rage from the or Hate Coil or a lot of the words we've been seeing lately when I, in my uh, WoW playthrough, it's kind of <laughs> throwing it out the window is kind of fun. All right, a bunch, bunch of stats here, and these things are highlighted here, which is interesting. This attribute is, sl is strongly recommended for you because you're training in Javelin Vigor spells. Oh! So apparently Javelin and Vigor both benefit from Might. 
Quickness is recommended because of Javelin. Wits is recommended because of Vigor. So I do have a point of uh, overlap between the two, which is good news. So we, we should read all these out loud just because the uh, exact definitions of some of these stats vary a lot from game to game. So, Might determines physical strength of the character. Increasing Might leads to more powerful attacks and stronger abilities, as well as increasing the Endurance defense. Alright. So right now, so putting a point into that would increase 3% attack and plus 3 Endurance defense, which I can click on, I believe. Endurance res uh, resists at attacks on the internal physical systems of the character. P poison, disease, stunned, etc. Et so it's like a fortitude save, sort of, kind of. Uh, if It is defined by the character's resolve and might attributes, but also can be influenced by equipped items, talents, and effects from spells and potions. So it's your resistance to bad things happening to you that aren't hit point related, necessarily. Finesse attribute describes your character's physical and mental precision. Finesse is used to determine the accuracy of attacks and spells, as well as increasing worn uh, armor's chances to reduce hit type. Example: a critical, uh, a chance to hit or a chance to uh, for it to graze. Okay, so finesse seems like it would be kind of useful because accuracy would help you with the with well everything more or less. But it does recommend might pretty heavily. I'd probably put a little bit into finesse. Quickness determines how often your character can use their abilities and spells during combat. So what, how much, what's the percentage of, so it's 3% cooldown reduction per point. So it's not fast, but it could add up depending on how many points the game gives you over time. Vitality determines the character's physical health and their strength of personality. Also increases the will defense. So and will's got to be your defense against, yep, mental based effects like confusion. Uh, so we currently have 10 vitality, so what's the percentage of bonus health? 5%. I like that it's given per percentage too, because we don't know because we haven't started yet. We don't know what the what to expect from flat values of health yet. It's like is this type of game like D and D where you start off for like six hit points potentially, or is this going to be like World of Warcraft where people are running around with two hundred thousand hit points and nothing makes sense anymore? I'm not a big fan of ridiculously high numbers in RPGs. Uh, the Wits attribute describes your character's mental acuity, their ability to observe their environment and pick up on clues. Wits is used to increase spell strength as well as increase magic defense. So multiple things here. So it helps with spell strength and magic defense, but also talks about your observation of the environment. So it sounds like having a strong mage around could be really useful just for being able to sell, see what's around here. It seems like it, it seems like a lot of these stats, instead of being the usual strength, dexterity, magic, and stuff like that, it seems like a lot of these are actually designed to be like. Uh, sort of compromise stats that actually are based around two concepts at once. So like wits contradict like almost in a self-contradictory manner like or at least in a surprising manner seem like they might be good for both rogues and mages for example because of the part where they seem to be useful for environment stuff which might mean that they might be good for detecting traps if I'm reading this correctly. Resolve determines character's ability to endure physical and mental challenges. Resolve is the primary attribute used to derive the endurance, will, and magic defenses. It also increases the dur durations of afflictions applied to the uh, by the character. Oh, that's neat. So it makes your negative afflictions more powerful, which means that this is simultaneously a tanking skill and a skill for that whatever that one school of magic is we saw that was basically about decay or deb or debuffs or whatever that we saw. All right, so let's start off with a plan here. So three percent attack and ability strength. I should put a few points into Might. Let's start with four, the half of our starting total. Then a couple points into Quickness, for example. Since this will help us with the uh, Javelin training. I know, actually... Maybe not Quickness immediately. Let's do Quickness and Wits. One point to each to, make, uh, to help our... Uh, Attack values on those two different individual skills while also helping us with, uh... Actually, no. I don't care about magic defense so much. Although the flat percentage still helps. Yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna put up a couple points into finesse even though it's not recommended because I want, uh, bonus accuracy and the ability to additionally defeat, uh, higher armor ranks and stuff like that. We'll see if I keep putting points into it, though. I might hold off on putting more for a while. This is my starting idea, though. Hello. 
Alright, so we have a lot of weapon skills. We can specialize in master, magic staff and throwing weapons, as you'd expect. But there's also bows. Do, so all the, all the weapon categories we just saw. Athletics, dodge, lore, parry, subterfuge, and control vigor. So you can only pick the magic skill that you've already invested in. Everyone can tie, try every weapon type, but if you're not a shock mage, for example, you don't get the control shock down here, for example. So it determines the character's ability to draw and control spells that use the sigil of vigor. Uh, higher skill values increase the chance of critical hits, which extend the duration of vigor's bonuses to allies. So it makes the skills actually last longer, too. Athletics determines a character's ability to traverse difficult terrain, as well as their ability to execute complicated moves in combat. Athletics is also used in dialogue to determine your ability to intimidate or physically overpower someone. Oh. So we're, gonna have, we're gonna be physically overpowering people in dialogue, apparently. I set off with 30 in that. That's our, just from the get-go, and we can, put, we can put 20 points in. Let's find out really quick here. Can I foot... I can. Okay, I can, put, I can put all 20 points into one thing if I want to. Two things to learn from that. One, you're not blocked based on your current level on how many points you can put into something, or at least or at least you can put 20 above your starting point, if nothing else. And uh, there's no diminishing returns. It doesn't suddenly be like five points to level it up or anything like that. It's, so it's always one-to-one, -one, apparently. Although there might be diminishing returns on the effect that it has behind the scenes. Dodge. Uh, the dodge skill defends against ranged attacks from bows, javelins, or magic spells. Higher skill ranks will reduce damage taken, or even cause enemies to miss their attack altogether. Lore. Lore skill determines a character's ability to decipher information and put together clues from fragments of information. This skill is critical for magic users who wish to learn new runes or power their spells. Lore is also used in dialogue to determine whether you know about the world, uh, the history of the world, or to impress others with your intelligence. So you can surprise people with how intelligent you are, but also it's good for our vigor spells. In fact, uh, everything's good for something here. So all three of them are javelin skills, and one of them is one of them specifically is a casting skill. Well, the, this one too. Parry skill defends against melee attacks and spells. Higher ranks will reduce damage from enemy attacks and may lead to them missile together. So it's not that different from dodge, just different math calculation more or less. Both, I'm sure, help. Subterfuge skill determines a character's ability to move unseen through their environment and uh, to detect and manipulate hidden traps and devices and to un uh, open locked chests and doors. It also is used in dialogue to determine your ability to deceive or trick the person you're speaking with. I don't think I'm going to be much of a trickery-based character, but uh, I probably will want a rogue if I can pick one up along the way to do all that opening stuff, of course. So I think this one... Yeah, I don't think that the, the weapon descriptions are that interesting to read through. I think they do exactly what we want. Th think they're going to do. Yep. Generally it leads to more accuracy and effective attacks and crit chances and stuff like that. Okay, so I've thrown some points around. I put five points to throw weapons, five points to control vigor, five points into athletics, two into dodge, one lore, two into parry. That's my napkin math at the moment. Ooh, hello. 